to talk about resource guarding today. We're going to have questions at the end of the 30 minute presentation. Please submit them as I'm presenting in the comments. Our team will be assembling them and we will answer hopefully lots and lots of questions at the end. So um, we're going to be building today on the dog reading course that you have done before and also our other um, Facebook Live training sessions. So let's get started. Again, the topic is resource guarding. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Nancy Kelly and I'm here for English Kinder Rescue America. Um, all right, so resource guarding. Shocking and terrible and, and dangerous for sure. And at the same time, completely natural. Perfectly natural for dogs to guard things they like. I mean, think about it, you do it. I do it. Look how we go to the ATM or put our credit card in a slot and you know, we even, We've, we've, as a society, we've made sure there's covers over that so, you know, nobody can see our pen and, you know, we lock our doors and we lock our cars and we try to keep our stuff and that's okay. It's also understandable that if a dog has something he likes, he would want to keep it. And so the way we change that is not by telling them they're wrong for doing it, but by telling them there's, there's a better way and there's lots of stuff for you to have and we want you to have it. So, so how do we do that? All right, so prevention is of course the most important thing. So going back to one of our previous training sessions starting out right with your new foster dog, it's just so important, you know, those first moments of preparation before you meet the dog preparing your brain, making a plan, and you know, getting all the things you need, having your treats ready and, and all that, and then that first moment that new dog comes into your house, you're already setting up how things are gonna be done. And one of those important things is trading them things for things that they have. So that's a handling skill for humans to just have and to just always do with dogs, so prevention. Um, so I have three things for you to remember in this regard. One is, remember what your mom taught you. Be polite. If you want something somebody else, else has, ask them for it. Um, we, you know, don't snatch stuff out of people's hands or out of dogs' mouths. Number two, testing dogs, as we've discussed many times before, is a terrible idea. Unless you've been doing some training and you're pretty sure he can pass the test, then we might do a tiny little test. But we're not gonna push it too far because if we see any hint of failure, we're gonna say, oh, we need a little more work on that. So it's not about testing dogs, it's about making sure they succeed because we never wanna see these behaviors that we don't like. We don't wanna see resource guarding and then try to fix it. We want to, we want to have those dogs show us the opposite behavior, right? Remember that from when we've talked before? Um, and the third thing, thing to remember is that you are teaching every moment you're with a dog. Remember that? That's super important. All right, so we've got a few areas of resource guarding that we're gonna talk about. The first one is item guarding. So that's when a dog has something in his mouth and he likes it and he wants to keep it and he's willing to tell everyone that he will keep it at a great cost. Um, again, it's very natural for him to do that. So, what are we gonna do? We're gonna trade. We're gonna trade and trade and trade all the time. So, we, well, let me address this. Once the dog has your shoe in his mouth, you're in a whole new reality now. Once he's already picked the shoe up, wishing that he hadn't gotten it, being angry that he got it, all those things are just useless. Just set all that aside. The only thing to do now is say, here I am in the moment, be present. Dog has shoe in mouth, what would I like? I would like dog to spit shoe out, right? That's really all you've got. You can't think about why he got it or any of that other stuff right now. So you trade. You know, your preparation is you've always got your treats with you, right? particularly if it's a new dog, and you're ready to trade. Um, 
So we're going to talk about how best to trade. I'm going to see if I can wake Albert up. Hey, buddy. Hey. You want to demo something for us? You think you can get up? Come here. Come on. Okay, so this is a giraffe. Do you, do you love a giraffe? No? Here. Yes? Maybe? Will you get it? Uh, will you get a giraffe? Okay, can you come over here? No? Can you not that? Okay. Oh, you're so silly. You're so silly. Here, get this giraffe. Get the giraffe. Okay, this may take a while, so we're going to talk first. So basically, whether he has a, treat in, a toy in his mouth or not, what we can do is, come here, buddy. Okay, we can do it over there. That's a good spot because you can see his face. So if he had something in his mouth, I would put the treat right next to his nose and he's gonna open his mouth, so he's gonna drop whatever he had so he can get the treat. So assuming he dropped it right straight down from his mouth, I can then bring his head here to give him the treat then I can safely pick the thing up. Because one of the problems that we can have is that once the dog drops the item, he may still want it. He may decide that he is gonna eat the treat and then go get the thing back, because remember it's something he liked. Clearly Al doesn't care about this giraffe. But, um, but you can imagine that. So remember that those treats give you a lot of power. Anytime a dog likes something, you have power. So let's see if we can do that again. Can we, let's turn you around. Okay, standing up, come here, bud. Okay, can you get the giraffe? Yeah, no, you take it, okay. No, he's just, <laughs> so we're gonna put it in his mouth, we're gonna hold it up there, he spits it out, we're gonna bring it around, and we're gonna have a big enough treat too, so that he can keep eating that treat over here while I reach down here to get the toy. So remember, you have a lot of power. You can move that dog around, all right? So stay safe. Don't cause additional guarding when you're trying to get the thing away. Um, okay, so how best to create a new reality next time? Put your shoes up, cover the garbage, put the garbage in the garage, you know, get the dirty clothes hamper out of the way, prevent, prevent, prevent. You also have to pick up all the toys and things. I mean, that's in your starting out right stuff too. We have to be able to control the environment. Um, all righty. And then the really important thing is to practice with the dog. Where'd you go, Al? So that, just like with this, even though you don't want to pick the giraffe up, we, we just practice with them. Because there is a time when they have a toy in their mouth or a bone or something like that. And we just walk over. One of the things I love to do is walk over trade a treat and then go oh is this good enough for my wonderful dog yeah it is okay you can have it back and with the new dog you can do that really briefly you can why don't you want to play you want to show him yeah no okay the toy is a treat huh so you get it and we give it right back because you don't want to be holding it and have the dog over there going um you know what i need that back so it's all about what the dog's capable of doing in that moment, whether it's a new dog or it's a dog that's had some practice with this game, right? Okay, so let's move on for a minute to location guarding, because that's another thing that dogs do. Um, they have their area where they're laying down and they're not feeling all that secure in this new home. And so, you know, they're gonna guard this spot, whether it's a dog bed or whether it's a spot on your couch or on your bed, they can guard it. So the first thing that we do in preventing that is establishing house rules. So I know it's a poor rescue dog and he's had a terrible life and all that stuff, but you don't have to let him on your furniture. It's completely up to you. You can let him on your furniture or you can not let him on the furniture, but establish that. And I would recommend if you're gonna let him on the furniture, there even need to be some rules around that. So with the new dog, you know, you already know from previous sessions, right, we shouldn't just let him run around the house and just pick, you know, oh, I'm gonna get on the dining room table and on, the, you know, just whatever I feel like doing. We wanna have a little bit of control over that and how you set that up or is, it comes in many, many forms. But what has to happen is it has to be consistent. So if you're not gonna let the dog on the furniture and maybe 
maybe in the beginning that's a good idea and then later let them on the furniture. But even if you do let them on the furniture, it has to be controlled and it has to be in a routine. So it's what we don't want is to walk in a room and the dog's on the couch and we go, oh, look how cute you are and go and sit down next to him. And he says, uh, I don't think so. It's my couch and I don't want you sitting on it. That happens so frequently that we don't want to set that up for ourselves, right? So what has to happen is, number one, if we're not going to let the dog on the furniture, then we provide a nice alternative. You know, we don't say, no, you can't sit on the lovely soft couch or bed. You have to lie on a bed of nails instead. That's not what we're doing. We're going to give you a nice fluffy bed but, or whatever they like. You know, maybe they like to lay on the tile, but, but that's their choice. We make sure that we've really let them know, I'd like you to have a nice comfortable place to be. So it, it is just as good basically. And then when you're on there, you get lots of treats. That's where you get petted and so forth while we create that routine, right? So that makes sense, I think. Um, so if the dog is on the furniture, whether you let him on there or he's not supposed to be on there, again, remember mom's guidance. You know, we, in, in no circumstance, should we ever walk up to any dog and yell no at him, grab him by the collar and drag him off of anything? That, it doesn't accomplish anything and, and there's really no reason for it. So, particularly with a new dog that you don't know very well, we're gonna, we're gonna call him off. So, you come in the room, he's on the couch, you're, you're worried he's gonna guard the couch or you just wanna prevent it. The way we do it is, we call him off. Hey, Al, come on, buddy. Yay, what a good dog. And when he gets off, he gets something yummy. That's his reinforcer for getting off the couch or off his bed. You can do it with beds too. So if a dog is laying in a bed, if a dog is in his crate, call him out. Don't give him that opportunity to feel threatened. As you know from previous training sessions, I never recommend moving toward a dog anyway. Certainly if he's on a bed or in a crate or whatever, we're not gonna reach in because what does that feel like? Put yourself in that situation. Put yourself in a corner, have somebody come over and reach for you and you're like, ah, you know, I don't have anywhere to go. It's, it's just not a good plan. So call him off, give him a treat for doing so. And the cool thing is that's your first step of training him to get off the couch, off the bed, out of the crate off his dog bed, whatever. So it's, um, losing my place. So take time at other times to go through a controlled process of teaching them to get off of a thing, right? It's, it's nothing more than a game. So they're in a happy mood and they're not in, you know, they're not in that place where they're super stressed and they're trigger stacking and they're feeling like guarding. And that, this may be further into their stay with you too. It's probably not the first couple of days, but it just looks like you, you put them somewhere. Come on, buddy. Hey, can you get on your mat? Yeah, he gets on his mat. Awesome. So if we were working on mat training, I'd give him a treat for getting on his mat, but we're not, we're going to work on off training. So he gets a treat for getting off. Come on out. He gets off, he gets a treat. And then later, we can attach a cue to that. And I, you know, I'm happy to, to work with you on that. And then we can teach him off and he jumps off. It's just a thing. It's just a game. Make it a game and it keeps the dog in the game playing, problem solving, training part of his brain. And not in that other part of his brain where it's emotional. It's like, uh oh, what's about to happen? Am I gonna lose all the good stuff? I'm scared, you know, I'm stressed and all that. Because once you're there, there's really no way to get out except just end everything, stop. We're gonna talk more about that, but um, anyway, so. All right, so the third thing that dogs tend to guard is humans. And I am gonna bet that many of you have experienced that with Springers, because it's pretty common with Springers, it's pretty common with lots of other breeds too, but it seems to be kind of a Springer thing. So the first step in preventing that is to make sure that the dog is friendly, offering friendly gestures toward all humans that he comes into contact with and not fearful of some humans. So that's gonna entail some, 
some human training, right? To make sure that everybody's interacting with the dog in appropriate ways, using good dog body language from humans, you know, not reaching for them, threatening them, and, and you know, all those things. So that, that's super important. And the reason it's important is, if you have someone in your house who the dog is kind of afraid of, maybe they you know, don't use very good dog body language, or maybe they're just a really big guy, sorry guys, but sometimes the guys are big and they're really big voices and they kind of just walk into the room and, you know, that's not good for a stressed dog. It doesn't, it doesn't work. So when, when, okay, so, so follow me on this. If they're afraid of one person and another person is the one who really takes care of them and interacts well with them, what's going to happen? They're going to develop a really close relationship with this one person while they're afraid of that person. And then they're going to possibly start to guard this person against that person coming close. That's a natural outcropping of being afraid of somebody. So it's super important um, that, that dogs are presenting friendly gestures toward all humans they meet. Now, can we really get there with every dog? No, we can't because we get some scared dogs. But we're always reaching for that goal. Always reaching for them to have a good experience with every human at whatever level they can manage. So, you know, I'm talking about a, you know, a normal dog here. What is normal? We don't know. But, it, you know, if you see any fear of any human, work on that because that's how you're going to help prevent guarding another human and also some other problems like true separation anxiety where they have to have that particular person with them all the time. It's just a problem. So that's step one. Um, we also can, some of the ways you would do that is get that other person that they're kind of scared of to do the feeding. Give them the best treats. Help that person create um, even if they're not going to be a primary caretaker of the dog, help them create something special for that dog to do with them. Maybe they're good at playing ball or, you know, maybe they like to go outside and, and you know, play in the yard with the dog. Let them, help them find something really good. Give them the good treats. You take the bad treats. You know what I'm saying? Not bad, but just not as good. All right. So, anytime a dog is near any human, we want that to be positive. And we have to coach the humans to do that. So, now what do you do if you have that dog who is already doing that? And these foster springers will start doing it the second day in your house. It, it seems like they've barely gotten to know you, but now you're a resource. And they're not protecting you from bad things happening to them. They're keeping you as a resource because they think you have a lot to offer. And you do have a lot to offer, but you don't need the dog keeping you. Oh, Albert, can you come out please? Come here, no, over here, bud. Hey, no, we're not, no, I didn't mean out, out, come here. So what you'll see it, and see, so Al's not gonna do this because he's just not that dog. But what you'll see is the dog will come and stand here. Make it sound better. So he'll stand a lot of times crossways in front of you and look at what he's guarding you from. So, okay, you kind of saw it for a second. I bet a lot of you have seen that. So, they'll communicate to you. I'm guarding you from that. They'll do it with other dogs, too. They'll stand in front of you and try to keep other dogs away. So, the way to deal with that is to recognize it and work within that dog's parameters where he can operate. So that doesn't mean we call the person to come over while the dog's doing that and say, no, we're not gonna let you guard and this person's gonna come anyway. Not a good plan. Because again, once he's doing that, he's, he's pretty stressed, he's focused completely on guarding. And so what you do is, if the dog is there like that, you just step away from him, reposition, you know, use a treat to get him to sit over at your, come here, come on bud. Use a treat to get him to sit over at your side, 
you know, feed him treats over there while you stand next to him. And then maybe you step over here to talk to that person and say, oh yeah, this is so great. Glad to see you today. And then you come back, give the dog something else to do. That's all, buddy. Um, this, so I hope that makes sense. It's getting yourself out of the position to be guarded. And every time you see the dog headed there, if you can predict that that's what he's gonna do, that's what you need to do, get out of that situation. Keeping the dog on a leash can help with that too because if you're with a new dog, if you have him on a leash and you're teaching him to kind of stay at your left side and you're feeding him when he's on your left side because that creates great leash skills, then he's less likely to come in front of you and the second he starts to, you can reposition and go, oh, but you need to be over here. So see how everything works together? It's just prevention and it's being able to observe what the dog's doing and predict what's about to happen, right? So that's the third one. Um, there's actually one more, and that's when dogs guard themselves and their bodies against you touching them. And it's, it's very similar to other resource guarding. And you know, what we use for that is just tiny detailed conditioning. I will touch your foot with a finger. I will pick your food up. I will touch your toenail. I will squeeze your toenail. And every one of those, he gets a treat. So he's getting, oh, I thought I didn't want that to happen, but I actually do want you to touch my feet because it's really good and I get a treat, right? So in a minute, I can maybe get out to do that. So the thing to remember is that resource guarding is based in fear. It's stress-induced, and it's perfectly natural for dogs to do. It doesn't mean we want them to do it. So the message that we have to send them through everything we do is, there are so many toys. We have so many toys in this house. We have so many treats, so much food, so many beds for you to sleep on, so many opportunities for you to have fun and get affection and great interaction, but they're safe and I can help you feel good about them. Treats are a big part of that. But that's the message we always wanna send. But at the same time, we have to control those resources. We can't put the dog in a situation where, you know, there's, there's stuff all over the floor, he grabs something and takes it and is, is guarding it. So another thing that's really important to remember is that in general, I repeat, in general, it's okay for dogs to guard their stuff against a rude dog grabbing it. Okay, so think about this. If one dog is rude, if, if one dog's over here just chewing his toy and playing with it by himself, and another dog is kind of a bully and just comes up and sticks his nose in and grabs that toy, and the other dog's like, whoa, what just happened? That's rude, and that dog shouldn't be allowed to do that. Um, you'll see puppies doing that, and sometimes an adult dog will let them do it because they're a puppy and they're just like, oh, dumb puppy. But if we don't start teaching the puppy to behave properly, then the other dog is gonna have to get on to him. And it's way better for us to teach the puppy um, and not, not have to have the dog you know, get really angry at him because it could stress the dog out. Now, is it okay if the dog growls at the puppy? Certainly. Once the puppy turns six months old, the dog can growl at him. But don't leave all of it to your dog to do. Um, so I guess the point I'm trying to make is, number one, dogs don't only guard things from other dogs, and then that behavior never transfers to humans. If we put a dog into a situation where other dogs are constantly being rude and taking his stuff and he's starting to guard his stuff and going, hey, you need to stop it, then that's gonna work for him and then he is gonna try it with the human. So the humans need to make sure that the other dogs are being as polite as possible and all the dogs are learning what they need to learn so that the dog isn't practicing that behavior because the behavior is the same. That behavior of, and you know, looking and 
I'm going to keep this and, you know, digging their nose in deeper and, you know, all that stuff. It's the same, whether it's a dog or a human reaching for the, the item, right? Um, so just think about that. It's important to manage your dogs. And in the end, if you have dogs that have learned that there is an abundance of stuff in their lives, there's plenty of stuff for them to have and they don't have to guard it, and people will be polite and trade them treats for it, and then sometimes give it back, then, you know, one day if a dog makes a mistake and comes up and starts to grab something and the other dog says, hey, I was still playing with that, it's a minor altercation and it's perfectly fine. That's perfect. That's communication between dogs and it didn't involve them really getting into it over the item. So the way that we set that up is through how we're preventing the incorrect interactions, right? Okay. So, and of course, don't let the humans be pushy or grabby either. There's, there's no world in which the right thing to do is reach in a dog's mouth and yank something out. Even if the dog has a, a rotten dead bird in his mouth, if you threaten him and reach for it, he's going to start swallowing faster. So it is always going to be better to pull out your really good treat, get the good treats, hold it out, Hold down a handful of them if you need to. If it's something, a dead animal that you want to get, get something good. Put it up to his nose and, and, you know, don't act like you're taking the thing and see if he'll drop it. Okay, so what if he doesn't? What if he doesn't? So we have ways to do that. So imagine the dog has something and it's really clear. He's like, whoa, I need to keep this at all costs. So we do have ways. One of the things that, that we do at the shelter is we call it the trail of chicken technique. So you get a lot of chicken or a lot of roast beef or something and you just, you start making a trail, you, you ignore the dog. Oh, I see you have that big deal. I'm going to just put all this chicken around. And I'm going to just put it around. I'm going to make a trail of it on the floor. And I'm going to toss some over there. In a minute, the dog's going to go, oh, wow, what is happening here? And chances are he's going to go see what it is and, and start eating it and leave his bird behind. Make sure there's plenty of stuff there so you can safely go get the item that he dropped. There's, I mean, there's a multitude of ways that we can go. So spray cheese is a great dog treat. Many dogs love it. Um, you can grab a can of spray cheese. Dog's right over there with this thing and, and you're like, oh, I'm not, yeah, I don't, I don't want that that you have. And you just start squirting spray cheese on the tile. Put some over here, put some over here. Again, he's so interested, he gets up to come get it. You can get the thing, let him eat the cheese, and you had a happy, wonderful trade. You can even, in some circumstances, you can grab a handful of treats and throw them across the room. If the dog has had practice with chasing treats across the floor, and he smells the wonderful chicken or roast beef or whatever, he's like, what? And he runs over because it's rolling, and that can attract him. He drops his thing and goes and gets it. So. Those are some ways that you can um, put into practice to get something away from a dog when you need to. So, the other thing, of course, is stress and trigger stacking. We have to address that because resource guarding can be a stress-induced behavior. And when you have a new dog who's just changed his home, maybe he feels bad, he's kind of, you know, mangy or sick or itchy or, you know, I don't know, whatever, has an injury, He's got new people in the house. There's other dogs that are in the other room and he hears them. There's a cat. Maybe the weather's bad. I, you know, you know about trigger stacking. All these things are happening. He gets a really good bone. What's going to happen? He's going to be like, I need to keep this bone because it's the only good thing in my life. It's the only thing I understand right now. So understand that and behave in a predictable and consistent manner for him and start at that very beginning. There's never a moment where we can say, oh, just this first time I've got to yank it out of his mouth. Now you've really set yourself up for the future in a way that you didn't want to. So um, remember mom's advice, be polite, and really look at stress overall. Reduce that stress one layer at a time, one layer at a time, because it's all affecting all of his stressed and anxious behaviors. And um, well, you know how to do all that. So, dogs can learn to control themselves 
and make good choices when we're predictable and we set up a very careful routine from the get-go. As they learn, then we can let up on those boundaries a little bit because we can predict what they're going to do too. And that's really what resource guarding is all about. So I'm going to stop talking and we're going to see what questions y'all may have and I hope to be able to address some of your um, important issues with your foster dogs. So thanks for listening. Okay, first question. How do we define resource guarding versus other problem behaviors? How do we define resource guarding? So um, the best way I know to answer that is that, well, if you, if you go back to the dog reading course, all of those stress behaviors that you saw there, in fact, there's a couple of the slides that talk about when you are, are viewing a picture of a dog that, I mean, it's actually a live dog, but it's, it's a picture that you see. There's a dog, he's lying on a blanket and he has a toy nearby and you see these stress behaviors of whale eyes or a wrinkled head or a lowered head or, um, you know, stiffening of the body, um, ears going back, things like that. Just the fact that there's an item in the area or the fact that he's on a defined location can bring to mind, it is possible that this is resource guarding right now. Um, if he doesn't have anything near him that it seems like he's guarding and he's still behaving that way, then it could be that, you know, I don't know, any number of things that the, that he was left alone, that the person he loves, that, you know, left the area, that it's thundering outside, that he, uh, you know, any number of things that are causing him that stress. So what we're looking for is the stress behaviors and then the fact that there is something to guard in the area. And now, if, a, if it happened to be a human standing nearby and you were seeing all those stress behaviors, you might question, is he guarding the human? But the answer may be no. It may be that the human's just there. Um, it's also possible that if a tennis ball is right there, maybe he's not guarding the tennis ball, maybe he's guarding the bed he's on, or possibly he's not guarding either one. So it takes a little bit of analysis to do, but the second you see stress behaviors, your first response is start to figure out what you can do to peel away the stress, to reduce the intensity of stimuli. Of course, don't add to it. Don't you know reach your hand in there right then. Call the dog to you. Put all your dog body language actions into play. And then file that away. Start trading with the dog and see what you see. So I'll tell you, my dear Albert is not above resource guarding. He loves to take toys to his bed and hoard them. And it's not, you know, he's not going to behave aggressively about them. But even that is just the beginning of resource guarding. And so we always are preventing anyway. And we know that it's really important for him to really start to value bringing stuff back. And so we've been working on that for, you know, a year now since we got him. And he, he's good at it, um, but he's not perfect. He still would enjoy to take something off by himself to have it for himself. And that in and of itself is resource guarding. So I hope that answers the question. And Beth wants you to remind people never ever grab something out of a resource guarder's mouth because you're setting them up to bite. Okay, so somebody pointed out that you should never grab anything out of a dog's mouth. And I think I've said that like 12 times in here. <laughs> I Next. would never, you will never catch me pulling anything out of a dog's mouth. My dog, your dog, a shelter dog, a random dog on the street, I'm not going to do it. And you know what? It's not really because I'm afraid every dog will bite me. I am not afraid that Albert will bite me. However, I know that if he's under enough stress and pushed hard enough, he will bite whoever he needs to because that's what dogs do. I haven't seen how far 
we need to push them to do that. But it's just polite. Remember what I said about, let's be polite to each other. How would you feel if you were putting your credit card in the slot and somebody reached over and grabbed your credit card? Uh, I think you get pretty mad. There could be a fight and other people might join in and we have laws about that. So let's make laws for ourselves about how we interact with dogs. We don't, we don't grab stuff from anybody. Okay, you're seven minutes over. Two more questions. The first one, please tell us about your treat pouch. Please tell us about your treat pouch. Um, okay, shall I be a model? This is my treat pouch. So this is, this is my favorite kind of treat pouch. It comes from um, uh, Dog on Good is the company. I love it. I love all treat pouches that have a belt that go around. They also have, they also tend to have this little clip where you could just clip them on your pocket. In my experience, you're going to bend over just the wrong way and enough times and it's going to pop off and all your treats are going to go on the floor. So I love the strap around my waist. I like this because it's kind of deep. This one came from my friend who trains in Sweden, but you can buy a doggone good one. There's, there's plenty of others. The standard one has the little metal thing, um, spring clamp at the top where you can open it and then close it. Those are great too. That's my second favorite. Um, you could put your clicker in here. You can put up to three baggies of different treats inside. Oh my goodness, treat pouches. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the next two things are situations. There's two now. Uh, one, the dog guards the space around them when another dog walks by that has an anxiety disorder. What do you recommend? Okay, the, we have a particular dog who guards a space around him when another dog walks by, and it sounds like the other dog has an anxiety disorder? I think so. Okay, so maybe he doesn't behave all that predictably. Um, first of all, that's, that's always a problem between dogs, and, and that's why it's a problem for deaf dogs, blind dogs, dogs with anxiety, old dogs who maybe walk all funny, really fat dogs that walk funny. Um, you know, dogs are pretty visual, so when they don't see the behaviors they expect to see from the other dog, they get all like, whoa, you know, ah, I don't know what you're about to do because you're weird. Um, so that's understandable. So apparently this dog likes to have a, a pretty large bubble around him, and this other dog apparently walks too close. What is too close? That's defined by the dog on the bed, right? Because, you know, we can't tell him. You just need to let this dog walk this close. Um, so, what do we do? This is when the human has to get involved. So first of all, there's always, we need to control that dog with the anxiety disorder and make sure that he walks by in a way that the other dog is not threatened. So can we change that over time? Yes, we can. What if, you, every time the anxiety dog starts to walk anywhere, you know, in, in, a, in a, we wouldn't let him walk toward the dog on the bed. That would just be terrible. We'd get in there and turn him, right? But if he's just walking in a parallel fashion by, we hop up, we toss a treat to the dog on the bed, and maybe we give this dog a treat in this direction. So I'm saying the dog on the bed is here, the, the walking dog is here, so we toss a treat on the bed and we give another one to this dog a little bit this direction just to kind of increase that space as he walks by. He moves on and I'm assuming that then it's okay once he passes by. So we can, we can totally set things like that up. Even if all we did was every time that dog is moving around, we're tossing treats to the dog on the bed. Sorry, I won't get them, I don't know why I was getting them off my shoulder. He gets where he's going, you know, maybe he gets a treat too, and we move on. So what happens there is Pavlovian conditioning. So the dog on the bed is like, oh, when that dog's moving around, I get treats on my bed? Cool. This is cool. So we're literally changing his emotional response. We're changing his emotional state from, uh, what's, what's about to happen with that weird dog, to love when the weird dog happens, you know. <laughs> bring the treats, right? It literally happens. So that's that's a start for how I would handle that. Okay, uh, last one for now. Um, 
I tried your idea of feeding part of the dog's meal by hand to get him comfortable with my being around his food. But when he's eating out of the bowl, uh, even getting close to the bowl or trying to drop something into it elicits the eyes and the growling. So what do you suggest? So this person is asking about, they have they've tried, because um, they knew they had a, a dog that was guarding food apparently, and they've tried hand feeding the dog and they're trying to work up to where now they have it back in the bowl and the dog's eating out of the bowl and they're just trying to walk by and throw treats in the bowl and so forth, which is a great thing to try, by the way. It's a really good start. But one of the things that we see, and this is just, just write this down. This is just a behaviorist's experience over the last 30 years. What we see is dogs guard their bowls more than they're guarding the food in their bowls in many cases. So one of the things that can happen is dog is great eating the food. You can even drop the food on the floor. You can put a pile of food on the floor and you can walk by and you can toss food toward the dog and, and you see, of course you're reading the dog's body language this whole time and you're seeing happy, open face, expectant, anticipating more food. I'm just happy and you feed me and this is great and you don't see any of the stress, you don't see the whale eyes, you don't see the stiffening. The minute the food bowl is in the picture, you see all of that because the bowl is what the dog has developed the, the propensity for guarding. And, and this is not true in all cases. Of course, there are plenty of dogs that just guard food in whatever fashion. But there are dogs who guard their bowls, and you know who knows how it started. I, you know, other dogs get in their bowls, people. I, who knows? We can't think about that. But the thing that I would do there is move away from the bowl. I would feed the dog in enrichment toys, um, magic mushrooms, and Kongs, and, and an Amazon box, and a, you know, feed them on the floor. Keep doing the hand feeding. You know, clearly that needs to be done more to make sure it's, you're separating food from bowl. And uh, at the time when you decide to move a bowl back into the picture, I would make it be a really different bowl. If it was a stainless steel bowl, I would go with a plastic plate. Um, I, you know what I'm talking about. If it's a ceramic bowl, I'm gonna go with a stainless steel, you know, differently shaped bowl. Um, so you're, you're changing the picture for the dog, what we've done, if this is the case with this dog, and you know, it's not always, but it's definitely a thing to look at. You're isolating exactly what it is the dog guards, and then you're changing that. I mean, dogs need to eat. Um, sometimes changing the food could help, but so often it's the bowl, and it sounds like that may be at least part of the problem with this dog. But other than that, the process you're using is really great. Throwing food, I mean, you can feed a dog by rolling food across the floor too. Um, and then there, there are other things that we might work on once we get the food bowl back into the picture, like calling the dog away from the bowl to get a treat and then sending him back to the bowl and so forth. But I would sure start with a different type of bowl. Okay, so it's 12.45, I got another question. Um, the foster dog doesn't know how to release and will bring a toy or ball to me, but if I touch it, he will growl. I hope he's growling in play, but I'm not sure, so I don't take the toy. Is he resource guarding? What do I, how do I progress? Okay, so you have a foster dog who brings a toy close to the person, but holds on to it and doesn't drop it, and when the person, did they say, touches the toy or reaches for the toy? Reaches for it. Reaches. If I touch it, he will growl. If the person touches the toy, the dog will growl. So who can tell me what would be the right thing to do here? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> um, okay, so, so again, if a dog is holding on to something, it should be very clear at that moment, he's not offering to give it to you. What's really cool about this dog is he's bringing the, the toy close. He's bringing it over and he's saying, I kind of want to involve you in my game, but 
and this is where his specific behavior is already isolated. It's in my mouth and I can't let go of, it, go of it. I can't let you have it. Super cool. Hang on to it then. I have ham. I have a big piece of ham. And you can just hold that ball. Come here, Albert. Where did you go? Come here. You can just you a treat. You can hold the ball and I will hold a really big piece of meat. Come here, bud. Come on. Come on, get out. You're so lazy. Come here. Let go. Oh my goodness, my boy. He's, he's so tired, this dog. So tired. Are you going to collapse? Okay. He's going to melt onto the floor. Okay. So, but if I could get him to look at a treat, so here's a dog. I have a dog, I have to use a hand dog. Okay, so here he is, he's holding the ball. I'm gonna just hold this here. I'm gonna go, okay, I'll sit here all day. You hold the ball, I'll hold the treat. What's gonna happen? Eventually, he's gonna be really enamored of this treat, or he's not and you're gonna get rid of that treat and you're gonna get out a better treat. You're gonna get a bigger piece of ham or you're gonna get chicken and you're just gonna hold it there. Eventually, he's going to open his mouth to get the treat. The ball's going to drop. You're going to bring his head around, give him the treat, reach for the ball. Thank you. And then what are you going to do? You're going to throw the ball for him, for him to go get, and then you're going to do it again. Because that's how he learns that it's better to go ahead and drop the ball. I mean, this dog's doing every step of a retrieve except opening his mouth and dropping it out. He's this close to being an awesome retriever. But threatening him by touching the toy that's in his mouth is very much like you putting your credit card in a slot and the guy behind you in line reaches over and snatches your credit card. Really? What are you gonna do about that? Growl at him? I would. No so. more questions. No more questions? Correct. So, okay, awesome. Okay, thank y'all so much. I am always here to help y'all with foster dogs. I have tons of resources. Most of them are on the Foster Home Facebook Group's um, files section and you can use them. And please avail yourselves of them and ask me any questions that you have and talk to your coordinators and get on the group and, and let's chat. All right, thank you.